A short time before these pictures were made, David Edward Stewart fell beneath a hail of rifle bullets and died. Another murder, another fugitive, and another police chase. Tonight in our century, Australia's history of unsolved crime, intrigue, and tragedy. These are a piece of the actual pyjamas worn by the murdered girl. The pyjama girl case baffled us. No cases intrigued, puzzled, or frustrated police and the public of South Australia more than this one. The Beaumont children's disappearance still mystifies us. And these cases had one thing in common. They were truly bizarre. There's no criminal more bizarre than the man whose name is inscribed here. This is the Manly Courthouse near Sydney, and the foundation stone says, laid by the Honourable T.J. Lay, 1923. Now, Thomas John Lay was Minister of Justice in the New South Wales State Parliament, but he should really be remembered as Minister for Murder, because as you'll see come election time, he left all the others for dead, literally. much of our century, a policeman's lot was quite a happy one. We prided ourselves on being pretty much a crime-free society. Of course there was the odd window smashed, the odd bag snatch, the occasional punch-up and police chase. The old film makes it look a bit like an episode of the Keystone Cops. But in this chase, the Melbourne police collared the crooks. Now it seemed to us that terrible crimes, like kidnapping, happened some other place. That our kids could play in our streets without fear. It was all part of growing up in Australia. Off you go now. Don't be late. Bye, Mummy. Bye-bye. But the end of this innocence came on the 13th of July, 1960. <laughs> Bondi, and the home of eight years old Graham Thorne, whose kidnapping is the first the state has known. It's a crime which has shocked every parent, every citizen. It's a crime which every Australian hoped would never happen here. When Basil Thorne won 100,000 pounds in the Opera House lottery, his name was splashed all over the papers. And why not? It seemed to be good news. No one even thought about kidnapping. There wasn't even a law against it in Australia. That's how rare it was. But it all changed when little Graham was taken and the demand came in for £25,000 or else. Well, all I can say is that the person that's body, if he's a father, he's got a chance to have his eyes open for God's sake, in the back. Mr Thorne was willing to pay the ransom, of course. But police feared that the boy might already be dead. Inch by inch, yard by yard, police and volunteers continue the search. But there's no sign of the boy or the kidnappers. And those fears proved to be right when Graham's body was soon discovered. Australia was horrified. Kidnapping was bad enough. Now it was child murder. Another crime that we thought could never happen here. It was forensic science that finally solved the mystery. Police found traces of plant and animal matter on Graham's body, which narrowed down the search considerably. And now they even had a suspect, this man, Stephen Bradley. But Bradley had skipped the country. His freedom was short-lived. The long arm of the law now had the benefit of modern communications. And police caught up with Bradley in Sri Lanka. The cars go direct to the CIB and Central Lane is blocked up as Bradley is taken to the charge room where he's remanded on a charge of murdering schoolboy Graham Thorne. Back home, the crowds bayed for Bradley's blood. 
Some even demanded that he be fed to the sharks. Instead, he died in prison of natural causes. The agony, of course, lived on in Graham's father. His lottery win meant nothing but grief. Now, there was no doubt that Graham Thorne was killed because of greed. Money was the motive. But the next time some Australian children disappeared, it was to be a complete mystery. Public interest in this case has increased to the extent where we see an amazing sight, a sight which I'm sure has not been duplicated in South Australia before. Australia Day 1966, and three children, Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont, the Beaumont children, went missing from Glenelg near Adelaide. Thousands of people and hundreds of cars lining every inch of the surrounds of the Panawalunga boat haven. This was to be a fruitless police search. And without a clue, Australia was traumatised. As always, there were so-called sightings. There was no shortage of weird abduction theories. Everything from white slave traders to flying saucers. Forensic science offered no help this time, so they turned to a clairvoyant. And on his psychic hunch, a warehouse was demolished, looking for bodies. Nothing was found. The new lead is said to be strong and detailed, that the children's bodies were dumped off the reservoir wall, possibly wrapped in plastic bags. The search ground on for many years. Strange letters appeared, allegedly written by the Beaumont children. A recent bizarre twist was the allegation that this Canberra woman was the missing Jane Beaumont, a claim later denied. The girl told me herself that they were handed over to a cult. The term she is, I'm quoting her now, a satanic cult. The three Beaumont children have never been found and the case is now officially closed. Well, I just yelled out, has anyone got a torch? The dingo's got my baby. It took Australia's most famous rock, a dingo, and a missing baby to set the scene for the most controversial disappearance of our century. A family's terrible tragedy that many Australians insisted was a ghastly crime. Liddy Chamberlain cried that a dingo had come into this tent and taken her baby Azaria. It seemed unbelievable. The dog was seen to run, as you can see, to the back there, over the sand hill, and several people chased it. And when the first legal inquest accepted Mrs. Chamberlain's version of what had happened, others scoffed and rejected her. To you, Pastor and Mrs. Chamberlain. Newspapers, television and talkback radio went into a feeding frenzy. The rumour mills went berserk, including absurd theories about an infant sacrifice in the desert. Lindy's trial became a circus, which sucked in not just Australia, but the world. This time, the forensic science worked against Mrs. Chamberlain. She was found guilty of murder and given a life sentence. Ah! Lindy Chamberlain went to jail and to purgatory for the next three years of a young life. Until suddenly, baby Azaria's matinee jacket turned up. The earlier forensic evidence was exposed as faulty. Lindy, who'd been so cruelly labelled a mother who'd killed her own baby, had her conviction quashed. This was a tragedy that tore the Chamberlain family and the nation apart. The early 1930s saw our police forces switch on. That's when Melbourne squad cars, at least, were equipped with radios. Not exactly user-friendly, but they did help the force get with it. It was about the same time that the New South Wales police hopped onto motorcycles and into sidecars for road patrols. And this was also when forensic science came into its own. Just in time to try and solve one of Australia's more bizarre crimes. Albury, the borderland city, charmingly set in the midst of fertile plains and gently sloping hills. This town was the locale of one of the most monstrous crimes ever committed. It began in 1934. 
when a farmer made a gruesome discovery. Then I noticed a peculiar looking bundle lying beside the culvert. So I went over to investigate and then I saw it. The half burned body of a woman. For a minute I was paralyzed with horror. And I got home as quickly as I could and telephoned the Albury police station. Such was this man's story which within a few hours had made headlines in every newspaper in the Commonwealth. It was the beginning of an investigation that would last 10 years. An investigation that would see police deploy the latest whiz-bang techniques in criminal science. Hope centred in the post-mortem, which revealed a compound fracture of the temple and forehead, eight wounds above the left temple and a deep gash caused by a blunt instrument. And then the unexpected finding, a bullet located in the neck. The police now knew how she died, but they still had no idea who she was. These Chinese pyjamas were all they had to go on, and they tagged her the Pyjama Girl. With all the publicity, this case had become a personal obsession of the state's police commissioner, Bill Mackay. And as you'll see, he was to play a pivotal role in solving it. They took the Pyjama Girl's embalmed body to Sydney University, where it was put on public display. Thousands flocked to this grotesque exhibit. In fact, viewings of her corpse became more popular than going to the movies. Now, it seems strange today, but remember, these were depression times. Times when a 1,500 pound reward was equal to five years' wages. Then dental aid was called in. The teeth were extracted from the dead girl's head and with these a cast was made. It was found that on one side of the mouth, the teeth were filled with amalgam, and on the other side with gold, a decidedly unusual combination. In spite of this, descriptions and photographs in the dental magazine brought no result. Of course, the police had their suspects. One was an Italian migrant, Tony Agostini. His wife, Linda, had gone missing at the same time as the body was found. And Linda bore a remarkable likeness to the artist's sketches. But Tony insisted that he was innocent, and by now the trail was getting cold. It was 1944, and the Pajama Girl mystery had dragged on for 10 years. It was then that this true story became stranger than fiction. Tony Agostini, the chief suspect, was a waiter at this swank Sydney restaurant, a place called Romano's. As it happened, Romano's was also where the police commissioner, Bill Mackay, often ate his lunch. And one day, Mackay noticed that Agostini seemed unusually sad. The commissioner asked him why. But to his astonishment, Agostini confessed that the pyjama girl was indeed his missing wife, Linda. So, despite all the publicity, all the hoopla, all the newfangled forensic science, it was the police chief who caught the killer. All because of a lucky lunch, and not a lucky hunch. Spectacular stop on the Prince's New South Wales agenda. Thousands had welcomed him warmly to Darling Harbour, but as His Royal Highness stepped up to address an Australia Day reception, a man firing a pistol rushed the stage. A political assassination in Australia? Well, most of us would say, nah, it couldn't happen here. On this occasion, it didn't. This time, the culprit had only a harmless starter's pistol. But it brought back memories of a real attempt to assassinate a member of the royal family on Australian soil. It's quite well known that back in 1868, Queen Victoria's son, Prince Alfred, was shot during a picnic in Sydney. Luckily, he was only wounded. But what's not common knowledge is that it nearly happened again in 1920. This time, the target was the former Prince of Wales. Now, these were tense times. After the First World War, Australia was feeling pretty isolated. Britain was our great protector. 
And what we didn't need was a reputation for shooting royal visitors. So we put on a show. Our loyalty to the British Crown was on display and the tour seemed a runaway success. But when the Prince took a day off, he was entertained on this Queensland property with the quaint name of Cooch and Coochin. What the Prince didn't know was that while he was out riding, the police overpowered a man in the bushes. He was aiming a rifle at the Prince. Now this was the second attempted assassination of a royal in Australia. So it was all hushed up. The Prince wasn't even told himself until he'd finally shaken the dust of Australia from his feet. He was three days out to sea on the voyage home. As usual, the last to know were the Australian people. Indeed, it was 10 years before it became public knowledge and the would-be assassin's name has never been released. and the Second World War came to Australia when the Japanese bombed Darwin. This time, a new protector was on our soil, Uncle Sam. We greeted the Americans with open arms, or at least some of us did. To the Aussie girl, a GI could be a good catch. Certainly, he had more money to spend than the Australian soldier. When a boy from Alabama meets a girl from Gundagai. The diggers resented the GIs and lamented that they were overpaid, oversexed and over here. But for three girls, one GI in particular was a fatal attraction. Melbourne women were murdered, allegedly, by one man within a fortnight. The bodies of the women who had been strangled were found here, here, and here. Melbourne women were terrorised, and relations between Australia and the United States were badly strained, until an American soldier, Edward Leonsky, was arrested. Armed guards around the room selected for the court-martial of Private Leonsky, who is charged with a triple murder. A military court found Leonsky guilty, and he was sentenced to death. A sentence which was endorsed at the highest level by the President himself. Leonsky was hanged on the 10th of November 1942 in Pentridge Jail. Many of our lawbreakers have become folk heroes. The obvious one being Ned Kelly. And some, we thought, were just unlucky. Like Ronald Ryan, the last man to be hanged in Australia. We also have a sneaking respect for crooks as brazen as Darcy Dugan. He escaped five times from maximum security. But there's no sympathy for a crooked politician. During the 1922 state elections, when the voters of New South Wales went to the movies, even back then, they were subjected to political ads like this one. Now, remember that bloke I was telling you about at the start of tonight's show. Thomas John Lay became the Minister for Justice, and Lay, it seems, left nothing to chance. Around election time, police often wondered why his opponents came to a sticky end. Reginald MacDonald went missing. Hyman Goldstein was murdered. Police had their suspicions, but they had no proof. So Lay just kept climbing the political ladder. In 1926, he even went into federal politics. When the grand old Duke of York, soon to become George VI, opened Parliament House in Canberra, little did he know that not everyone sitting there had a squeaky clean reputation. Lay finally lost his seat in Canberra and as evidence began to mount, he caught a slow boat to England. But in London, Mr Lay just couldn't lay low. He got involved in the wartime black market. 
then he committed a murder in Britain. This time he was caught and sentenced to death. He escaped the noose by pleading insanity. But he died in Britain's Broadmoor prison in 1948. So you'd have to think that's the end of his story, that we'd finally got rid of him. Uh, uh, down here in the National Library in Canberra, in amongst the personal papers of people like Captain Cook, Sir Robert Menzies, Patrick White, so many Australians, we came across Thomas Lay's family papers, old cases and documents that had been gathering dust for years. And amongst them was this. It provides a bizarre conclusion to our rather bizarre story. Now this is his last resting place. This urn contains the ashes of Thomas John Lay, crook, black marketeer and killer politician. If you've enjoyed our century, be sure to get a copy of the soundtrack CDs featuring music from the series. Available at all good record stores. <laughs>